to me. And so uh, next one is approval of the minutes. I need a motion. Yeah, moved. Uh, moved by David, all in favor? Carried, okay. I'm doing this hybrid thing. I, I've got a, a computer open and my iPad. And so I'm reaching for the computer screen to uh, touch it and, and make things move. So uh, it doesn't work. Uh, you, you need the most. Um, any public comments? No people from the public. Presentations uh, from Bonnie about wildlife re regulations. Please take the floor, Bonnie. Thank you. So I guess just this presentation, I'm, I'm really happy to present it to this committee, as I feel this, this uh, recording is a conduit um, to providing education to the community. And um, also, I, I feel that the subject matter, I'm very passionate about it, not only in my, my uh, private life or my, you know, my home life, but also um, I've had some experience with invasive species um, throughout my work career, and also um, sitting on the Regional Invasive Species uh, Advisory Committee from Metro Vancouver has been um, a really great um, opportunity to learn about um, invasive species across our region. Um, I'm going to touch upon initially just, you know, it's just a smattering of what we could talk about. But I feel that because this is my last meeting, um, this is a presentation that I did originally present to BIFS at an educational um event that they had early in the summer, and it is modified a bit, but um, I'm just really happy and I'll kind of zoom through it because we are short on time. It's a big agenda. We haven't met for a little while. Um, so, and what I did is I really linked the presentation or tried to um, highlight how the the, the content of this uh, presentation fits with our climate action strategy. So with that, I will share my screen, I think. Oops. There we go. So the presentation is entitled Growing Food, Managing Mammal Pest Species and Protecting Biodiversity. And it's advancing okay? Yep. Is it? Yeah. Yep. So everything's connected. I really feel like that's my favorite tagline. And connections and overlap occur between our quest for food security on Bowen and everywhere and managing pest species while ensuring ecological integrity persists. So this presentation, as I've already sort of highlighted, um, addresses the, the pest species that may affect our ability to grow food on Bowen and um, ways to protect biodiversity. It was originally presented to BIFS and it was it was interesting. It was time the timing was interesting because it was right after the coyote had had just been spotted on Bowen. And I feel that the content of the presentation fits within section eight of the climate action strategy, which is protect and enhance natural system and carbon sequestration. Section nine of the climate action strategy, which is protect and enhance regenerative agriculture practices. And section 10, gain active support for climate action strategy. And also I feel that some of the content does correlate with some of the components of our work plan for this year. So during the past decade, or I've been working for the municipality for 11 years, I've had many complaints about mammalian species. So deer, of course, raccoons, skunks, eastern gray squirrels, rats, mice, voles, dogs, cats, rabbits, mink, otter, beavers, bats, and recently uh, coyote or coyotes. And I guess, you know, really the question I, I, I ask myself a lot is how do we address the concerns of some of the community members um, 
And I really have come to the conclusion that education um, about the options that exist and the laws pertaining to pest species are important. And ultimately, curtailing some of our behaviors is key to addressing some of the pest species. And it's interesting too, perception is, you know, what is a pest species and, and what isn't is, is another philosophical question. Um, yeah, we could delve deeper into that, but we won't today. So I just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of case studies that I find interesting. And I'm, I, I just want to share them with you. Um, I did my undergrad thesis. So my undergrad is from UBC, a BSc in agriculture, but I, I focused on wildlife studies and that interface between agro, agriculture and forestry and the wildlife that inhabit both of these, you know, those, those um, sort of habitats. And um, I did my undergrad thesis on Virginia opossums who made their way to Hornby Island in about 1986. A ferry worker saw a fellow with, um, I think, two or three opossums in the back of his pickup in a cage, and he was taking them over to Hornby to his homestead for pets. But unfortunately, I guess one, one or more of them escaped, and um, Hornby Island does have quite a healthy population of opossums. They're very opportunistic. They're omnivores. Um, so I was looking at their stomach contents, and there were many Chiquita banana stickers in their stomachs, uh, feathers, which I was able to go to the ornithology lab at UBC and identify the species of native birds that they were ingesting, uh, snakes. Um, there used to be some grouse on Hornby Island. I don't think they exist anymore. There were anecdotally, um, you know, sort of whether or not it was attributed to the, the influx of the, the, the opossums, but um, definitely the grouse population seemed to um, bottom out when they arrived. So I just, I just, you know, we haven't had a sighting of an opossum on Bowen, and I just really... I really would like to be very vigilant because they they, they can just yeah decimate um, or or have an impact a negative impact on ecosystems for sure. And what's interesting about them they're in a they're actually a marsupial they are only North American marsupial. And then moving on to raccoons, I I spent about three to four years studying raccoon raccoons on Haida Gwaii, and um, again introduced species introduced by the government in the forties over to Haida Gwaii for many reasons. Um, they, you know, of course, um, the island effect, they became very small, they, they live a wonderful um, life eating seafood. And they are found at low tides on beaches, some places in huge numbers. And they have decimated the um, some of the populations of seabirds, um, ancient murelets and auklets. Um, so that was interesting. We we're looking at possible ways to eradicate them, but they're on more than 125 islands. I saw them swimming in high seas um, between, between islands. And of course, Norway rats um, on Langara Island, the provincial government has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on eradicating Rattus norwegicus uh, from um, Langara Island. By all accounts, they say it's a success, but it really only takes one one more rat there. And it wasn't to the you know demise of um, ravens and some other um, species because poison was used um, in some of the the eradication. So yeah, it just it just talks to the different you know mechanical methods, chemical methods, and how you know our methods to eradicate or, or curtail the spread of these species. Um, really can have detrimental and far-reaching effects. So just, I'll skip over this, but just so there's a lot of relevant legislation, not only for food growing, but also um, for uh, protection of, of uh, uh, ecosystem health and all sorts of things, but just lots of, lots of uh, legislation pertaining to sort of that cross crossover, or the connections between um, growing food and, um, pest species and treatment of the pest species and in enhancement of biodiversity. So chemical deterrence, um, BIM, of course, adopted the pesticide use control bylaw that this committee was very instrumental in, in moving forward. 
Um, and all pesticides, of course, have the capability to deleteriously affect mammalian species and our environment. Rodenticides are particularly harmful to wildlife species. Rodenticides enter ecosystems and kill non-target species reducing biodiversity. And the province um, introduced the 18-month the prohibition. I have heard of, for the second generation anticoagulant rodent, rodenticides, but I have heard that they are thinking about prolonging that. And maybe some, some other members of the committee have more information, but I, I did hear that. And I have not seen, they were going to do some studies and come up with, you know, the, the, the fear is that, you know, rodents will take over and, and their populations would spike. Um, but I, I haven't, I haven't caught wind of any um, studies that have been done to see if, um, you know, there was any short term effects um, with the ban in place. Um, but there are a lot of exemptions to the ban. And I, I won't go into all of this just for interest of time. Um, non-chemical options. There's there's lots of non-chemical options. And this is what I was relaying to Biff's in the audience for the event that happened this past summer. Um, you know, it can be expensive to deter pests from our food. Um, and, and it can be a lot of work. So, um, but yeah, individual plant and garden plot protections. Guardian anim animals, if you know, if if someone has the property, llamas are really great guardian anim animals. So can geese be? Geese can be very, or lots of lots of things. Even chickens. My chickens squawk when something comes into the yard. Um, picking fruit as it ripens, uh, and yeah, because the the ripe fruit has high caloric value and. Coyotes particularly, really, um, it's a sought after food source for them. Um, fruit can be picked before it ripens. Electric fencing to protect fruit trees and gardens. And it's really important to manage organic um, and garbage bins. You know, maybe in the future, as we evolve here on Bowen Island, we may have, you know, bylaws. I mean, most people are pretty good about really being cognizant of putting their their food waste and garbage out just the morning of because it can be very problematic if it's out you know a few days before pickup uh, also the use of repellents and scare devices can be used but but a lot of animals become very used to deterrence so you know we have to be creative um, and there's lots of people have great ideas and things that have worked for them like it's amazing when you start talk about talking about deterrence what people come up with and trapping, um, trapping is really tricky. And um, the the one thing that that happens commonly with trapping is that non-target species are trapped. And there is a high probability that an animal will endure distress or pain with any form of trapping. Trapping skunks and raccoons may be done with permission from Provincial Conservation Office. But um, the person who wishes to trap must consider method and responsibilities associated with the trapping method and what will happen with the trapped animal if a live trap is being used or if a um, uh, like a lake hold or soft lake hold trap or some other form of trap is being used. Otters are protected species under the Wildlife Act. These are all in response to questions I've got over time, um, and mink, beaver, and coyotes have specific regulatory provisions requiring trapping in the outlined in the Wildlife Act. Act snap traps for small rodents could be used, but care again must be taken so as to not trap non-target species. And compost, the compost bins are so attractive, so definitely um, again lockable lids. Metal, maybe better than plastic, removing meat, meat byproducts, fish and cooked fruit and vegetables, sprinkling lime on compost can be effective. Um, and covering the compost with light layers of soil or heavier, heavier cover of cut vegetation can be effective. And again, too, just really important to put those compost bins out the morning of pickup. If the conflict um, persists, the compost, a compost bin may need to be relocated or a secure enclosure around the compost bin may need to be installed. And that is just a smattering. And I just, I, I just can't talk about uh, animal 
invasive species or pest species without just I'm not going to touch on these, but over time, we will be putting out, I think Carla's on this, we're trying to do every two months a uh, feature invasive species. And more will be revealed about these three species. I know McKaylee, um, the bullfrog, I mean, that would be really great. Maybe you and Carla could collaborate in time to come here on a publication about the American bullfrog. The Japanese beetle, there's lots of information as it is a very problematic and um, alarming species, um, and so is the European green crab. Um, these three, uh, you know, we should be vigilant, very vigilant on Bowen Island. Um, yeah, so we could talk at length about each of these species, but um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight them as very, very problematic and very disrupting uh, to ecological systems on Bowen, potentially. So just going over to Carla now, um, and she's going to speak more specifically about our invasive plant management program that we've been uh, working on here for a number of years on, on Bowen Island. And I feel that the invasive plant management program fits under a number of uh, climate action strategy um, sections, namely section six that's increasing protection from droughts as, as our native plants have adapted to cycles and are, you know, a lot of them are, are really quite drought, drought tolerant. Section eight, um, protecting and enhancing natural systems and carbon sequestration. Invasive plants can really disrupt carbon cycling. Um, and section 10, gain active support for the climate action strategy. And that is all through, um, community involvement or you know it's a, a big section in the climate action strategy and and um you know we're really trying to do that through Canada Day invasive plant table where McKaylee was there as well and um yeah and through you know just education education so with that I'll stop sharing and turn it over to Carla thanks Bonnie <laughs> thanks so much Bonnie Okay. Okay, we all good. Everyone can see my screen and hear me. Yep. Great. Um, okay, so we've been working on invasive plant management a little bit beforehand, but I think since about 2015, I think was when we first approached council. Um, I was just going to give you a little short overview today of what we've been doing and also tell you about our most recent um, battle with butterbur, uh, a relatively new invasive species on the island. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of background, um, we don't actually have any um, bylaws pertaining to invasive species management. But the BC uh, Weed Control Act and regulation regulates noxious weeds. Um, it is worth noting that that's only for noxious weeds. Um, so there's a list, a schedule A is all of the provincially noxious weeds. And then there's another schedule B, which is a, um, a list of locally invasive weeds. So um, it's just those ones that a landowner must control the weeds on their land. Um, any of the weeds on those lists. So for us, I think um, knotweeds and hogweed is on there, as well as gorse, um, yellow flag iris, and not a whole bunch of other ones that um, I see commonly here. Um, so right now, oh, and as I said, there's no bylaw, but we do have a, a leverage point with development approvals for um, requiring people to control invasive plants on their property. Um, but for us um, as staff, we have a council directive currently to control hogweed and knotweed on um, public property. Um, we have a small budget that comes with that and some staff resources. And so what we've been doing with that is um, first, the first thing is mapping. Um, we do treatments as well. 
Um, but we do spend a lot of time on education. So um, recently we've completed this brochure with Metro Vancouver um, that is available on the webpage, which I also completed this year, um, which just focuses on some of the more prominent invasive plants on the island. Um, it basically just highlights them and sends you, uh, it gives you a bunch of links, which sends you to more information about how to control them on your own property. Um, we do, more recently, Bonnie had said as well that we're highlighting specific invasive species in our communications. Um, and what we're trying to do with that is um, do uh, an invasive species action uh, for each month or two, asking people to control that specific invasive species on their property to make a little bit of headway uh, with that one um, for that period of time. And we also offer support. So uh, neighborhood groups that want to do invasive species removal in their neighborhood, especially when they're doing um, even on their own property, but on roadsides, public property as well, we help them out with disposal and we also help them out with um, tools. So they're always welcome to borrow tools. Um, they just have to organize it with us beforehand. So the butter burr, um, I guess it was just earlier this year, there was a, a member of the Invasive Species Council of Metro Vancouver had alerted us to the presence of Japanese butter burr um, on the island here. She was just here on a little weekend vacation and, and saw it and took some pictures and sent them to us. And I don't think we were super aware of, about the concerns about how invasive this plant can be. Um, it's quite uh, striking. The stalks grow up to about six feet tall um, and then the leaves are about four feet wide. Um, you may have seen it growing before on Adams Road. We um, we are mainly concerned because this plant can get into stream sides, um, which makes it a lot harder to control. It grows in really damp, wet areas. Um, and that, you know, it makes it a lot harder to get rid of, um, harder to use herbicides in those areas if it's necessary, and then harder to revegetate, um, you know, once you do remove it. So what we did was we immediately shared some information on social media and with the garden club. And we added this species to our invasive plant webpage. Um, we also realized that because there was not a lot of sites um, on the island, that this was a really good candidate for early detection rapid response, which is um, you know a strategy for invasive species when they haven't taken a hold yet. Um, this is the way to go about it. If before they can really get established here, um, we try to get rid of them as quickly as possible and um, get pretty aggressive about control. So I mapped the eight sites um, that we found them on and uh, contacted all of the property owners um, that had property kind of behind those sites and asked them to control it on their own property or give me permission to, um, to treat it on their property. I didn't find a lot of, um, in my research, best practices. So I contacted the city of Portland because they had been asking about, um, asking people to report sightings of Butterbur since uh, about 2016 or 2017 and figuring they would have some experience um, I spoke with them and they told me that they've had limited success with herbicides or with manual removals or really anything else. So um, they felt for us having us having found it on the island, um, but basically just said, good luck. So <laughs> because we had um, four sites along Taylor Road and because we didn't really have um, any best practices to go by. Um, I just thought it was uh, an inspiration to do a really simple experiment along here. And this is actually kind of why I made the presentation was um, just to uh, make sure I had a record of that and um, a place to kind of 
keep all the photos and um, to go back and see which one worked best. Um, so we have four sites. They're all about the same size. Um, we did manual treatments on site three. So we went in there with um, shovels and dug out as much of these roots as we could. Uh, they were quite extensive and they're all connected. So it was much more time consuming than we anticipated. Um, the rhizome is like all networked and put together and it's not easy to get out and especially not easy to get every single piece out. Um, so that was when we realized we should try a couple of different methods and, and maybe try to think outside the box. And because we had noticed that it was so similar to yellow flag iris, just the rhizome system, and it shared some, um, some characteristics with the yellow flag iris in, in that it grows in those really damp areas that we thought we might try to do um, a similar treatment where we covered um, the entire infestation here with um, some landscape fabric. This landscape fabric might be a bit too breather, breathable. We, in yellow flag iris treatments, we use a, um, a thick vinyl that doesn't breathe at all. And it's actually the plant's own respiration and the chemicals that it emits that poison its rhizomes and cause complete necrosis of the plant. So it's very effective for that. We'll see if it works here, but we just kind of thought, it's worth a try. So we used a line trimmer to cut down the, um, at site four, just cut down all the plants. Uh, was really quick, just took 10 minutes. And, and then the last site we're treating with herbicide. So um, I did make sure to uh, record how many hours each treatment took and uh, we have a follow-up plan, and then I will check on the plants in um, the spring, coming spring, and we'll check on them again in the fall, uh, probably twice a year for the next little bit. We'll check and see how effective our treatments were, and perhaps switch around to the other treatments if one proves better than the others. Um, next up, we are going to be treating some yellow fly gyrus. This will be the first time we're treating yellow flag iris. We um, actually, thank you, Michaeli. Uh, Michaeli alerted us to some yellow flag iris in the stream that's um, leading into Grafton Lake. So where you, you know, if you're doing the loop trail and I think she told us about that last year, but we didn't have a lot of time. And I was also a little reluctant to jump in there. We don't own the property. We didn't own it last year. We still don't own it this year. But I think at this point, it's really important that we don't let this plant get into the lake. And so far, it looks like it's not in there. With There's maybe four or five sites along the stream. So we'll be treating those next week. And yeah, hopefully we get it all before it becomes a big issue. So that's it for me. Thank you, Carla. That, that's uh, you, you're uh, uh, really getting your elbows in there. That's that's great. <laughs> yeah, we I've got to right. Yeah, yeah. Well, well done. Thanks. Any um, other, any comments or questions? Oh, there, Michaela has her hand up. I'm so proud of the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. <laughs> um, one of the species I um, am kind of terrified of coming to the island is also goldfish. Um, that has a tendency to be released by, um, you know, people that get goldfish for their kids and then they release them into a lake or a water course. And um, up at Pinecrest Lake, that has been absolutely devastating. They actually had to um, empty the lake and um, electroshock fish and try and remove and, and cull all the goldfish in that area, um, which of course had, would not be great for Grafton Lake. <laughs> um, so I think that would be another education component um, 
Um, and, you know, it's something to make people aware of just to keep an eye out. And, and also the education behind not releasing um, pets is really, really important. Um, so I wanted to add that. I also, for the yellow flag, for the work, any work that you're doing within the bed in the bank of the channel, that land, even when it's transferred to the municipality, is actually owned by the province and is subject to the Water Sustainability Act, and you'll have to go through the 45-day notification process. And so if you need a hand with that when you get there, just, just um, let me know and I can, I can give you a hand. The, are you sure about that? Just for invasive species treatments within, I thought that invasive species treatments might be exempt and also that we might be exempt for um, that purpose. Um, as far as I know, restoration projects um, um, within bed and banks, you know, owned by the province are subject to the Water Sustainability Act. I don't know if the municipality is exempt, if it's part of your um, agreement with them um, I'm not sure. Um, in other conversations with, that I've had with the province for something else I was doing, um, they sort of indicated that if the municipality wanted to go ahead with some yellow flag in removal and explosives creek, that a notification would be required. Um, and if that was going to be long term um, mitigation to offset for some impacts that I, this is why I was talking to them, um, that a water license would also be required. So um, this is a slightly different scenario. So I would just make sure that you um, contact them and just make sure um, if you don't have a contact at front counter, I can, I can pass that on too. Thanks, McKaylee. McKaylee, you are one heck of a resource. Thank you. <laughs> hey, McKaylee, actually, um, if you wanted to volunteer to help me at all, um, <laughs> I, I was looking for another species to highlight in our next um, invasive species communication. So if you wanted to um, help me with a little blurb on goldfish, I would welcome it. Okay. Okay. Um, let's touch base tomorrow or, or yeah, tomorrow. We'll yeah, sure. Done. I'll give it a go and, why don't, and you can just add to it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if the idea of um, tacking on um, uh, all, all, all uh, I, I'm going to say tropical fish, but in, any fish that uh, people buy at a pet store should be, um, I think, tacked onto that um, um, goldfish story too, just because there's, there's yeah. lots of things that are out there that... Uh, um, could become invasive if, if they're given the chance. So. Yeah, paint, uh, sl uh, turtles. Turtles yeah. too, right? And well, them. and aquarium plants yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, keep your aquarium at home, I think is a good story, yes. And then there was also a fish that was in Burnaby Lake. They had to drain the lake and it was this massive, I, I can't even remember. It was horrible looking. It, the was, one a, that could it was a walk? snake fish or something. It was yeah, just, it. it was horrible. It was <laughs> like something from <laughs> oh, the <laughs> Black Lagoon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And any, any more stuff for Carla? All right. Well, thanks a lot, Carla. And, and thanks, Bonnie. That, 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 those are great presentations. Um, Local Government Climate Action Program from Bonnie. So I just wanted to just touch briefly. I think maybe, I don't know if one of the councillors too wanted to pop in after I just give a little update about the two CAREP funded projects, um, but um, just about the new local government uh, climate action program. And I'm not sure what can be disclosed or not, but but um, I just wanted to just touch briefly on um, the Uncharted Waters film. Uh, Carla, Carla and I, but it will be Carla moving forward, um, is organizing a uh, screening at the hearth um, where Adam Taylor wants to be part of that uh, screening with his underwater um, 
uh, life, uh, maybe a little tank, and then also die, art by die would be there, and also the Marine Stewardship Initiative uh, folks would be, be on board there. So I don't know if everybody's been able to see the film. It's quite short, and it's quite quite lovely. I think that, that Hannah and Molly did a really good job. So that is depending on the hearth's availability of space, it will be this fall or early winter um, uh, screening there. And then um, also there was the Thrive Bowen, the Greenhouse Initiative uh, document that was circulated. Did everybody get that? Yes, it's a, it's a hefty document. It really is, yeah. So maybe um, the next meeting of ECAC, um, David Adams said he could come, maybe Mayor, Mayor Beth um, could come to speak uh, to that, um, give the give the committee some time to review the document anyway. Um, yeah, and just uh, jumping around the order here a little bit, but we, we have about $4,000 left from last year's CARAP fund um, because we we put a call out for for uh, the sustainable grant um, grants uh, takers, but we didn't have any any uptake this year. Um, but maybe I'll pass it over. I don't know if I don't want to put you on the spot, but I don't know if maybe uh, Councillor Nicholson or Hawking could speak to maybe maybe some more money that might be coming with the new provincial program. Sure, happy to. Do you want to do it, Maureen, or do you want me to do it, or? How don't you start? Okay, so the municipalities in Metro Vancouver, uh, when CARAP ended, um, there was a lot of communication with the provincial government is that we needed, a, in order to address climate change, we needed a regular um, regular funds so that we could actually plan action and, and need to be more than the tiny little bits that we had. So they've revised their program completely, and it's a new new one. We don't know exactly what amount we're going to get now, but what they said is they're increasing the amounts, but they're particularly increasing the amounts for smaller municipalities. They're leveraging it towards the smaller municipalities because we ended up with such tiny amounts of money. Um, uh, we did hear, Maureen and I did hear how much they thought we were going to get this year. Um, I'm not going to use that number because we haven't really had it confirmed, but it's much, much larger. And um, we haven't had a, you know, an internal discussion, but in informally um, we wanted to make sure there was, uh, because there's much more money that there was still a, a component for um, sort of community level action like we've seen before, uh, but the amount, because, it's, because it would be much more, there's also um, an ability to take on larger project that might have, ongoing funding each year, something like that. So um, more, more news to come. We don't know the amount right now, but uh, we expect it to be much, much more and to be every year. That's great news, David, thank you. Mm -hmm. Maureen, do you have any, anything to add? No, that's basically it. I was hoping that we would have gotten a confirmation letter from Minister Heyman's office by this point. Um, it's the amount is actually noted, David, in the UBCM update, but I flagged it as uh, we need that confirmation first. Yeah. That they are comfortable with our releasing it. But our, our reaction at the meeting was basically astonishment. It was like, yeah. what? <laughs> You've increased it by how much? And uh, they had a good laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's that's great. Well, me, thank you for sharing that. And um, maybe at the next meeting, once we know sort of what we're looking at, I mean, there is the 4,000 from this year and then whatever we might be getting from last year, sorry, and what we might be getting from this year. Um, and maybe the committee could have a good fulsome discussion on brainstorm on some some ways to, to utilize that money. Does that I sound like he is already? I think I think council needs to um, once council gets confirmation of the amount, then council has to figure out um, okay, what sort of approach do we take to make sure that we still have a community part, but we also might be able to put it towards some ongoing projects, like things like the multi-use path. I'm just inventing that as a possibility, but you know, whatever. 
um, we might have some big projects that actually need help. We'll, 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 we'll see what the amount is and then council will have to figure out, okay, how are we gonna divide this up? Great. There's also the option of just holding on to it for a year or two and letting it uh, accrue because three years of the amount that they were talking about is a very significant chunk of change. Yeah. 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 And that could help with, for example, the composting project. Yeah, that's right. Great. So anything else, Bonnie? Okay. So uh, new business. Kate Roger Curtis proposed um, Munis, uh, Metro Vancouver Park and Campground. Bonnie. So I just from a staff perspective, I just wanted to say that, you know, we don't we don't know a lot at this point. Um, we have not received or the municipality has not received a, the, the final uh, rezoning proposal yet for Metro. Um, what we did do at the Parks and Trails Committee is you know, it's not too early for people to voice their concerns or, you know, just getting it on record, but um, there will be the process of rezoning OCP amendment, um, that that sort of thing in that process will take time. Um, but but again, because I know at the Parks and Trails, there were some of the members that lived on Wales, white sales and, you know, had some concerns. So I spoke with Liam and, you know, it's, it's not too early because um, staff compiles those those ideas, um, concerns. So, you know, maybe we can open it up just, you know, on a high level, what um, the initial concerns are, and more will be revealed as we move along the process. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt um, uh, um, being generated by people that I don't think know very much about what's going to happen. Um, so I, I think, um, uh, putting things, what, what, uh, what the municipality knows and, and for Metro Vancouver to uh, um, have their proposals uh, uh, very clearly stated is, is gonna be important here. Could I just add a little bit here? What I suggest everybody do, um, in, could do it right now or do it a bit later, is just do uh, online research, type in Metro Vancouver Cape Roger Curtis, and they have a website that's dedicated to this. And so, and they'll be putting updates. So what, what that does, it explains basically what's gone on so far, which is not a heck of a lot, um, and, but then the process going forward. And, and in terms of the rezoning and the consultation with the, with the Bowen, Bowen community, it's sort of a three-phased approach and it describes it a little bit on that page. So it's sort of step one, probably early in the new year is listen and learn figure out, okay, what's the community saying about this? Step two is then develop a draft plan and then get feedback on that. And step three, then you come back with a, with a, a final plan. So that's probably somewhere around a year from now we're, before we're at that stage. So there's, there's lots of time and there's a specific process for, um, for everyone to explain what their concerns are. And you know, we, we're all hearing um, uh, quite a bit about that, about the concerns. Yeah, David, another document I think everybody should should uh, have a look at is the, the new Metro uh, uh, Parks Plan, yeah. which uh, uh, talks about the, uh, uh, the, the the principles that they follow, uh, that they're going to, well, that they follow in developing and managing parks. And, and uh, from an environmental point of view, it's really heartening to see uh, um, that the, the emphasis is on uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, keeping uh, habitats uh, uh, strong, and, and also making uh, land sustainably available for people to do recreation in, in uh, the passive ways of, you know, hiking and, and uh, uh, bird watching and that kind of thing. So um, that, that's very heartening from, from someone who's been involved with lots of parks and planning. So. Yes, and Maureen's on the Parks Committee and she's been involved in the process of developing and approving that plan and she might- Great, have great about, work, Maureen. Yeah. yeah. Um, the additions, the major additions in the, uh, in the new park plan are to add to preserve and uh, connect people with nature, uh, principles of equity and um, reconciliation. So that they're very aware that um, um, Metro parks are 
sometimes inaccessible to people who don't have cars and they're trying to figure out how to uh, enhance enhance access and to, in some instances, really kind of change the focus of some of the existing parks. It's a good plan. Yeah, I really like it. Um, anything else on Cape Roger Curtis um, from staff and council? Any comments from uh, committee members? Don, I, I know that you uh, uh, wanted to see some kind of discussion go on. So uh, how are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good, thank you. I, I, I like David's comments and or uh, I'm not sure where we go with it, but but I, I think we all have, you know, you know, issues or or not issues is too big a word, concerns or 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 yeah concerns and 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 i think maybe doing a list of what those concerns may be in terms of how they impact our committee work or or maybe they don't impact our committee work but but it just seems that there 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 there, there could be a possibility where we might want to get engaged in some of that process um, it was just a thought yep jeff do you have any uh, any comments I don't actually at the present time. Well, um, I, I, um, I I like uh, the suggestion about reviewing um, some of the material from Metro Vancouver and um, and the, uh, the the park plan. Yeah. Yep. And McKaylee. I think at this point I'm just waiting to see what what they propose. You know, I I um, I'm happy that it's going to be a park. I'm really pleased about that. Um, given how careful they've been with the Dorman Point Trail. I, I don't know if anybody knows, but I've been actually doing the monitoring for the trail that's been going in there and the work that's been happening out on Dorman Point. Um, and um, my impression with working with the biologists at GBRD is that they've been incredible in how they approach the development there. Um, I would suspect that Cape Roger Curtis is going to be very similar and that they're gonna take just as much care um, so I just look forward to seeing what they propose and, and then being able to provide comment at that point. Thanks, McKaylee. I'm, I'm going to also take the, 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 this chance to say thanks to David for all the work he, he's done on making this happen, you know, making this possibility come, come to uh, fruition. So uh, well done, David. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Will. And I, I must say, I'm um, disappointed in some ways that I'm not um, running for council again, so I can't, you know, continue the process of of, of making this uh, go through. But um, I would, as a citizen, I'll I'll, I'll stay involved. Um, just one thing about to, um, about Don's point about this committee being involved. Metro Vancouver will will be looking at what are the organizations at play within. Bowen Island that have could have something to do with this and so yeah they will reach out to this committee but some of the key issues of course are things like transportation which are sort of to some degree um yeah uh, on the climate change side um um work of this committee would be involved and I just yeah climate change Maureen's point about equity um is, was really important um so that you know people who don't who live in apartments and don't have cars because they don't need one in their regular life they can come to a park like this uh, metro is concerned about equity but also about climate change they don't want people to have to have a car in order to get to um to their parks or to go camping so that's all part of this so the transportation is more to uh, the probably the transportation committee but it has has an element for this committee as well so thanks all right any more comments? Okay, let's move on. Um, wildflowers and pollinator initiative proposal. Bonnie. Oh, you're, Carla, you're muted. Carla, could you just um, speak, just briefly, just a, a brief update and sort of, this came about from a, an email from um, a concerned resident and just with some good ideas, so. Carla, if you could speak to yeah. this item, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, 
Right. So we just have had a, a request from the public to do some um, an initiative with um, with pollinator plants and uh, kind of letting letting wildflowers grow. Um, I think that the idea was kind of to do that on the along the roadsides um, where it's just not really possible for us. Um, a lot of the basically the only flow mowing that we do is for safety. Um, it's because we don't have sidewalks and people need a place to walk safely beside the road. Uh, and then also for visibility for passing vehicles. So um, we couldn't really do it on roadsides, but we do, we are going to try to incorporate that into some parks. So we're looking at some different areas where we might be able to add some, um, some pollinator gardens, some pollinator seed mix um, to those gardens. We don't do a lot of mowing in our parks either. We actually only mow um, two parks and the library, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and those are the, oh, sorry, three parks and the library. And those are, I knew there was one where I was couldn't, couldn't place it, but those are, you know, uh, the only areas that we do mow. Um, part of the problem is that those seed mixes for pollinator gardens have a lot of invasive species in them, as we've already been talking about today. Um, even if they don't say they have invasive species in them, a lot of them have them. Uh, aren't we lucky, though, that McKaylee is on our side because she's been doing plenty of research on, um, on a native plant mix, uh, seed mix, that we can get uh, get provided for us at a pretty good rate. So it has some some native wildflowers and some grasses. Uh, and that's really invaluable because it's really hard to find native wildflowers that will grow in non, you know, in our landscape. Most of these wildflowers grow in deep, dark forests where it's um, not so exposed. So so getting them to grow in places that are really disturbed is is difficult. So thanks again, McKaylee. And um, yeah, we'll we'll keep you updated on what we have in store for that. that that's great. Um, I'm I'm happy to see um, not going to uh, planting um, lots of flowers on roadsides. From the point of view of the insects, the pollinators, that's um, like putting a candy store right beside a, a major highway. Uh, and uh, letting kids run across the street to, uh, um, to, to get the candies. You know, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of insect uh, carnage that comes from, from vehicles. So uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And the other thing I was gonna say is if there's a, a, a good mix that McKaylee's um, found, I think that would be uh, something that we should be um, uh, publicizing to to uh, homeowners as something that they can use at home, um, because I think that there's going to be more effect if home homeowners are doing it than uh, the municipality is doing it with three parks with with limited area. So, just a thought. Um, I just wanted to chime in. Thank you for the hat tip. Um, I did it out of purely selfish reasons. <laughs> um, I, uh, in the work that I do, a lot of the recommendations basically boil down to when you're done, um, throw down some seed to hold the dirt in place and this is what I recommend. And I realized a lot of my clients um, didn't have access to that or it was expensive or whatever. So what I ended up doing was designing a Bowen Island seed mix and um, worked with a business out in Surrey um, to blend it for me. And I'm actually giving away little jars to my clients so that when they're done their work, they have what they need to scatter the seed afterwards. Um, so it was purely for marketing and business development on my end. <laughs> and um, thank you. <laughs> Um, I do have, I bought five and a half kilos um, to try it out and to see how well it does here. Um, I have Archangel that grows in my backyard um, and I was waiting um, um, to remove some of the trees that were growing there. And um, that's my next step is to tackle the Ar Archangel. Um, and my plan is to remove as much of the vegetation as possible. I, I don't know if you guys have um, experience with that, but it's um, evil. Um, so you basically remove the vegetation and it, it, it will 
re-sprout. So I was going to try and out-compete it with this seed mix that I have. So um, um, that's my plan. If anybody else is interested in trying it, I'm happy to share. I can give you guys a little jar um, and you can you can give it a try at your places and, and please report back. I, I, I want to be first in line. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks, thanks, Michaeli. Uh, that that's a wonderful project you're working on. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it, it's uh, you know Bowen focused and, and so environmentally uh, sound. That's it's great. Thank you. Um, any more comments on that part? Wildflower pollination? No. Okay. Um, let's see. We're down to uh, ECAC uh, uh, work plan review. Bonnie. Hi, everybody. I, you know, the work plan, I, I'm feeling, you know, I went through it, I was like, ah, you know, we haven't done some of these things this year. Um, some of them we have done, and some of them we've done indirectly, um, as just staff initiatives. So um, maybe going through it, um, we can get an idea, like, because we, we want to build a work plan, a doable work plan for next year. Um, and following this item will be some ideas for next year's. I mean, it's in preliminary stages, although we would like to have next year's plan in place by the end of this year. But I think, you know, and I don't want to say that, you know, the pandemic and, you know, everything has played a, a role, but, but I think it has, and our committee hasn't met as frequently as it has in the past. So, um, as I say, we have done and we have completed some of the initiatives and some of them we haven't, but it doesn't mean that they can be that they can't be carried over into next year. Um, some of them are ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. Um, but Steph, I was wondering, are you able to bring up the work plan and we could just go through it quickly um, and then we'll get you know, the next meeting will sort of synthesize what comes out of out of this meeting and, you know, produce kind of a, a draft of the of next year's. I mean, we still have a couple of months left of this year as well. But I just know with um, me leaving and I know the, the workload uh, that that Carla has right now. So um, can you see that? Yeah. Yep. So the water conservation strategies, um, I'm wondering if, again, I don't want to put Councillor Nicholson on the spot, but I know that there's, you know, been some look at water pricing structures. Um, so maybe, Maureen, are you comfortable, comfortable or able to maybe speak to um, some work that's going on in that, in that uh, realm? Not really no, okay. um, at, at this point. I think that's still very much in development. Yeah. In between the CFO and the uh, the various water districts. But one of the things that I did do was I asked um, for background information on um, our current levels of water consumption. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll find the, the numbers in a, in a few moments and share them but they're actually remarkably low um, in comparison to water consumption in other areas of the, uh, of the province. So um, maybe just carry on and I'll find those numbers yeah. and share it with the community. Yeah, Thank, thanks Maureen. Yeah, Annette put together some, some, uh, some numbers for us and it was, and she broke them down from water, uh, water districts as well in Bowen. So it was very, very interesting and, and we are below the, the, the averages, the national averages. Um, you know, I think this, this summer we were fairly lucky with um, drought conditions and it sort of seems, you know, I don't want to be reactive as staff but you know we do react sometimes and you know it'd be lovely to be proactive and really delve into the a um option the research create signage develop educational material you know the invasive species indirectly does help with water conservation um and uh so we didn't have a climate uh, conversation specifically on um, water conservation, but I know that there's lots of talk when people come in for, for building permits. Our building inspector is very progressive. Um, uh, we field questions, provide education um, where, where, where needed or where, wherever possible. Um, 
not saying that we can't have a climate action um, conversation again next year. Um, I, I think item D here, um, I know the fire hall, um, maybe Maureen, can you speak to the fire hall and yeah. the good installation yeah. that's occurred there? Yeah, what they have done, and it's a it's a, a cost issue um, initially, is they have um, not included uh, solar panels and they have not included rooftop water capture, but um, they they are essentially ready for both um, when the money be becomes available. So the the arrangement, the solar panels. The, the roof is fine. The panels can go in and it's it's set up so that they, uh, uh, the, the hookup is pretty seamless. Um, with the um, uh, roof uh, water capture, it's set up at the moment so that all of the, um, and this is like a very lay person's description, forgive me, so that all of the um, downspouts go to a single pipe and that single pipe goes out to um, uh, sort of a reception area. And when the funding is available, that single pipe will be um, routed to a, a, a tank. And uh, it's just a matter of when the money's there to um, put in place the solar panels and to put in place the, um, uh, the, the uh, essentially the, the tank. Yeah, thank you. And I did find that the consumption mm -hmm. numbers, which I, I think are really quite fascinating. Um, this is from uh, Liam, and I guess he's summarizing from uh, Annette. He said that the range on Bowen is between 180 to 230 liters per capita per day, which is considerably lower than the Canadian average of 330 liters per capita per day. And StatsCan uses a figure of 411. And the BC average for water consumption is 540 liters per capita per day. So in terms of our consumption to begin with, we are very low. Um, it doesn't mean that we should not be conserving water because you know, that, that will have uh, good impacts, um, and obviously there there are times during the year when we need to be conserving conserving water, given the supply and the storage that we have we have available. But um, I mean, that was the question that I came to when I was reading through all of this, um, was well, exactly how much water are we consuming right now? And uh, overall, it seems Bowen Islanders are pretty pretty water conscious to to begin with. That's really good to hear. I've, I've got a question about uh, the data. Does that include um, people that are on wells? Um, does that include the people who are on wells? I wouldn't think so, because I wouldn't yeah. think that we would have access to that. Yeah, I, was wondering about that. It, I, I would think it would be based on, on the, the municipal water, water yeah. systems. But I also would assume that people who are on wells would be even more conscious yeah, I agree. Consumption. Yep. I know when I was on a well, I mean, we just, uh, we were so frugal in the summertime because we did not want to face problems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Maureen. Yeah, yeah, it's great information. Um, and so, you know, my suggestion would be, I mean, we could have an iteration of this same talk at water conservation isn't going anywhere for, for the next um, at least that banner, and then look at what we can do um, as a committee uh, to promote water conservation. So we can we can have we can we'll work on uh, you know the preliminary work plan for next year, but water conservation topic seems to be relevant. Definitely, McKaylee. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, I did notice that there was another discussion around, um, um, I think it's like water retention or stormwater uh, roof runoff being used for um, like being a requirement for new builds. 
on Facebook, Bowen Island, everything else. Is there somebody, like I didn't want to step in and start providing that information, mainly because I didn't want to speak out of turn. Is there somebody at the municipality that does the social media aspect of things that can help um, engage thoughtful discussion around that and actually explain what is being done at the moment or where things are at? And not the fact that it's Muni, but the fact that it's coastal health. We could. Um, so I don't, not familiar with what the social media was saying. Um, exactly. There were a few things. Um, it basically said um, somebody posed a question and it was something along the lines of, I don't understand why the Muni isn't requiring all new builds to have um, basically water retention, stormwater retention as part of the new build for water usage. And then there was a conversation that ensued about how some properties already have it and no, they don't understand why not. And why can't we just go ahead and do this? <laughs> And so I, I decided that I didn't want to step in, um, but it seems like there is a lot of misunderstanding or misconceptions around, um, um, I guess, what can be done, what can't be done and where, where the legislation lies. Yeah, it sounds like a, you know, an opportunity for some sort of communication piece. Maybe that would be bigger than I know our, our communications coordinator is very busy. So not saying that it's not worthy of communicating out to the community, but I think maybe it's a bigger issue that maybe that's a, an item for this committee for next year, really looking at what, you know, what can be done, what are the, you know, the who who authorizes what, uh, what yeah. jurisdiction things fall under, some clarity about um, water capture. Okay, and is it, would it be safe then to interject, you know, instead of, you know, Facebook is terrible for this, where people, it's just a witch hunt that brews, mm -hmm. um, to just interject and say, you know, you can call a muni and get this information. <laughs> Um, and, and if I were to do that, would I direct them then to Greg? Is he the person that they would talk to? Greg is a great resource. He's amazing. Yeah. He, he's a great resource. Yeah. I mean, it could go through us to the environment department and um, as well, because Greg's only here Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. So, but he does answer his email very, very well. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a good suggestion. And um, uh, it's not just the folks who are on Facebook who are asking the question. I mean, my understanding is that at the time of rezoning, um, you can require um, this to be you know, part of the rezoning. Um, in discussions in other contexts um, about why not requiring a it of, of homeowners generally, it's a cost and people are, are hurting um, these days. I, if I remember correctly, um, Greg did come to this meeting a couple of sessions ago and, and um, uh, Steph, do you recall, was he not expected to report back with some answers on this topic? I invited him and we were quite jazzed and then he got here and we said, okay, what do you guys want to know? And then we, people were a little, I don't know if you got the meat from him that you wanted to um, at that time, mm -hmm. but I think some, if McKaylee wants to work with staff on getting information and getting it into a written form that we can give Sophie, she can post it. And as you mentioned, we're not really a place to engage in conversation, but if any that link exists, we can use it to, to share with people, this, these, these committee members, or to share with people who are misinformed. It would be really, really useful. Yeah. I, 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 I think this is something the committee could do, especially 
uh, maybe with, un under the direction of McKaylee, just um, have the, the facts that, that are, are relevant and um, have it available for the communication staff as needed. So, you know, it, 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 it would have to be uh, uh, approved by the, the staff involved. But um, I think one of our jobs is I hope to assist staff in, in getting th the things needed done. And, and I think McKaylee's made a really good, strong point that it would be useful to have um, people uh, have, have the information readily available to people that are looking for it. If I can just add a little bit here, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, um, uh, there are a couple of things. First, the point that Maureen made about cost. I mean, right now, um, our island is becoming unaffordable for many, and we're doing, you know, we're doing what we can to find find solutions so that we can afford, so that more people can afford to live here. But the other is that I, I believe it's not within our jurisdiction to do this. There are ways, if I remember correctly, the discussion with Daniel, there are ways that we could do it, make the whole island a development permit area and have, have it done that way, but it's a bit complicated. This is clearly a direction we'll need to go in the future, um, but it, you know, it needs to be thought out a little bit more as to how we would do this. Definitely. So do we have a, um, uh, a direction to go on, on now? I, I think this is like, as I say, we'll, we'll, we can sort of synthesize and put into a draft form uh, what, um, yeah, we're just working, we'll work through this, we'll get some ideas, we'll bring back a, um, a, a draft of, of our work plan. So if we could just continue on with the, yep. the yep. conversation, that would be, be great. Um, so what the next section is transportation. Um, <coughs> Steph, are you able to advance to the next, the next page? Thank you, Steph. And um, I do believe, again, BIMTAC hasn't been meeting super frequently uh, lately, but um, I think the multi-use path project is advancing nicely. And um, yeah, so I feel that, you know, I think it's ongoing. I think this would be an item that would be ongoing. Um, yeah, that would be my, my, anybody else have any other comments about that? Um, I I, just, I, go, ahead. go ahead, David. I could just add a little bit is that for the, the park initiative, the Cape Roger Curtis Park Initiative, one of the commitments that Bowen Island made in discussing this with, uh, with Metro Vancouver, so sort of a joint commitment basically, is that we have to have the multi-use path completed as part of this because, um, you know, if we're encouraging people to get there through active transportation, we've got to give them um, an ability to do so. So, and, and council is working on that. Obviously it's a, a significant funding issue, but um, there, there are funds out there for this, but usually you have to have about 25% um, as a, you know, the local government has to put up. And when you're looking at a project that, oh, a rough estimate for the whole thing, uh, the work that needs to be done left is probably somewhere around another $8 million. A quarter of $8 million is, is, is two. Um, two million dollars is a lot of money for this municipality. So you know there's some obstacles in the way. Well, mainly money and time, uh, but it's it's in the plan and it's something that we're working on. Yeah, and and I, I was just going to add that looking at uh, uh, under um, uh, what uh, A and B there, I think those are both ongoing. Um, things that, that we should just continue to, 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 to work on. Great, thank, thank you, Will. Yeah. That's great. There sure are a lot of e-bikes on Bowen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then the waste management section. So where we're at with the compost facility is uh, we're bringing forward to the new council um, a business um, case for for the, the facility. So, yeah, we've been kind of waiting for the election um, just to bring the new council up to speed on, on all the aspects of the project. Um, so 
I, I have to say that we haven't advanced a lot of these initiatives outlined in our work plan this year, but I do anticipate moving forward because it's sort of like, it was almost like Carla and I were geared up to concurrently, not saying that we we have to have the compost facility going to address zero waste, but but it was sort of just, we were really in that mode um, when we were full on uh, about the compost facility, but with all the other capital projects and just, you know, looking at the numbers and, you know, my, you know, just things have changed. Um, things are more expensive. So we need to revisit um, all the numbers and, and, and look at the business business case uh, for the compost facility. And I look forward to, you know, maybe helping in some capacity down the road as a volunteer as well, but um, zero waste is, is, is important. Um, but I, I can't say that this particular item has that we've done a lot of work on it this year. All right. Does the does the committee look think that we could carry this over into? I I, I agree. Other committee members, I can't see everybody on my uh, iPad at the moment. So uh, if you yeah, just, I agree. go ahead, Don. No, I just said I I think it's a good idea. Okay. Great, thank you. And then moving on, uh, we have the build, building efficiency. Um, you know, I'm really happy. I hear a lot of talk about heat pumps and personally know a lot of folks that are installing heat pumps. Um, uh, you know, I think we should always be looking for incentives, um, incentivizing and um information i feel that you know definitely compared to like five years ago i don't know this is just my opinion people are way more aware of like heat pumps so i don't know if that's yeah just word of mouth like it just it just seems like a, a commonplace installation these days um, i think uh, the, the one thing the muni might consider doing is um uh making sure that uh, citizens know about the uh, um, uh, the grants that are available to get heat pumps. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, well, I, I know because I have a heat pump and my neighbors go by and see the heat pump, they come to, and ask me the questions. I fill them in on, on those things. But uh, uh, the, the thing that surprises me is that quite a few people still don't know that there are uh, um, grants out there to uh, help home homeowners uh, install them. And that's especially important these days when uh, everybody's financially stretched. I think every once in a while, Sophie picks up the latest info from uh, uh, BC Hydro and, and sort of like that. But to Bonnie's point about you know, sort of the level of community awareness being much higher. I mean, one of our first climate conversations was about heat pumps. I don't recall if any of you were there, but there were probably 60 people in that room asking questions about this strange new thing called a heat pump. And uh, you know, the, the, the awareness is just, it's night and day. Um, and, and that's in a very, very short period of time. Great to see. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. So, as far as building efficiency, I mean, there's always opportunity to um, enhance efficiency. So, I don't know if this item, if it's something we want to keep. Um, maybe uh, just I would, I retrofitting. Would, mm -hmm. I would keep it. I think one of the things heat pumps are, are doing is. Um, overshadowing all the other things that you can do to uh, uh, make your house more energy efficient. Um, uh, you know, I think Maureen said it once, is the, the best thing you, you can do is insulate your house better. And so I think that that message should still be out there. Great. Perfect. Thanks. And the, the next section is environmental protection. And, you know, this committee had a lot of great input with the site alteration 
bylaw um, and also the conservation development policy. Um, so, you know, I really believe this is ongoing um, and a lot of these, um, uh, you know, new policies, bylaws are, are you know, environmentally, um, env environmental policy and bylaws are referred to this committee. So, um, yeah, and at a staff level, of course, we do have a lot of input with reviewing subdivisions, rezonings, DVPs, development permits, um, those sort of thing. So I think this one too is sort of just an ongoing um, initiative. Um, attention drawn to item D, where um, I know Will is going to speak to this later. So some great strides have been made in, on this front as well. Um, and then community-based climate action. Uh, the sustainable community grants. I mean, I, I think, you know, we we tried, we did promote, um, but it just, what, there just wasn't the up, uptake this year, um, but there's still the money and I'm sure, you know, we can get people re-engaged and excited about climate action on our island. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunity and maybe some more money coming our way in 2023. Uh, we did not do the sustainability tour again. I, I just, I felt, yeah, it just, the summer just came and went and uh, yeah. So, but it's definitely, I think it's a great idea and I wouldn't want to lose that idea. And the Residence Climate Action Handbook, um, the Sandage model, I've got drafts, like notes, drafts, um, but nothing really substantial. Um, but I've got like categories of, of different um, aspects of uh, climate action, places where people can take action. Um, I hope it could be developed more fully um, in the future. And it's something I want to get done before I left. And it's just not going to happen, unfortunately. But um, my draft <laughs> notes will be, will be there for my successor. So, yeah. <laughs> Do you see um, in any ways that you could hand off parts of it to the committee to uh, uh, fill out, you know, add some uh, some meat to it and, and then pass it back for, for further development uh, just yeah. to speed things up for, for? Yeah, definitely could do that. I mean, it's rough, but. Yeah, the one thing that I wanted to just bring up is like the Sandage model has a, a tool like those, you know, how your ecological footprint type tool, um, your carbon footprint. Um, I just, I have my own personal opinion about those sort of tools, but um, I don't know, what do others think of those? To me, for me personally, um, I have a hard time conceptualizing emissions. Like I just, I just can't, you know, I can, I can, you know, can see how much an airplane ride to, to LA is going to be. Um, but I, I don't know, it's just not that meaningful to me. And I guess those sort of calculators have been around for quite some time. I don't know how effective they are. Um, I kind of like those concrete actions. Um, yeah, like uh, gardening, um, yeah. retrofitting, like, yes. yeah, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what do others think about those calculators? Like those, I just, just curious. I, I Don? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, 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 I've got strong opinions that I'm gonna leave till near the end. Okay, well, not that I have a strong opinion, but but uh, uh, I think there, I think those calculators are important, uh, you know, because because for other people, it's 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 another way for them to visualize or or grasp how what they're doing and the impact it has. So I wouldn't I wouldn't just throw them out because because some of us don't like them. I think I think it's another way of. Of of tackling the, the 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 problem, and I would suggest we keep them. I think they're really important. And considering emissions are going up, not down, you know, is probably a good thing to point that out. That's my two cents. Okay, thanks, Don. McKaylee. Um, 
I actually did that with my one of my kids as a homeschool project. We went through the calculator and um, as a house and decided what our emissions were. And based on that, came up with the five-year target and um, proactive things that we were going to do as a family to work towards reducing our footprint over the five-year plan. Um, we haven't come back and checked it yet, but we um, it was one of the driving factors in, you know, when we had to buy a new vehicle, what we were going to look for, and um, pretty much all the choices we make for, for purchasing everything. You know, do we really need this? Can we buy it secondhand? Um, so it's really been a helpful way for us um, as parents to give our kids an understanding of, of um, everything that we choose has a consequence globally. Thanks, Michaeli. How about you, Jeff? I think Maureen had uh, her hand up ahead of me. Oh, sorry, Maureen. No worries. And I, th I think there's still value in uh, in keeping it. It's a it's a concept that's um, been around for a while, and uh, full credit to Bill Reese out at UBC for coming up with it. He it it. It draws attention. It may, may not be as subtle as you, you might wish for, but um, I, I still think it's worth keeping. <clears throat> Jeff? Uh, that, that's uh, the calculators are certainly of interest to, to some people that want to put some of the energy into it. Um, you know, I, I love uh, the idea of some different kinds of tools for different kinds of people. You know, if you had, um, uh, you know, pick uh, pick three things you're going to do this year from a list of 20 and um uh I, you know I, that might be more impactful uh for some but um anyway i think some different strategies to um to draw attention yeah. thanks uh david yeah thanks uh, thanks will thanks everybody and michaela your story is really good um to get the whole family involved my my worry about this is that uh, people like Don and McKaylee and a couple others in, in this room um, will do this and a whole lot of other people um, will be unaware and not involved. And it's, it's reaching beyond the converted, the people who are already caring about this, it's, it's really important. And um, we need to find ways to do that. So not, I think the, yeah, these calculators are great for people who will do that, uh, who are interested already. Um, Finding ways to reach out beyond that are is is really tricky, and it's something that um, I've tried to focus on, but it's it's really hard. Um, I guess I'll leave it like that for now. Um, I, I'm probably going to be doing some work in the future on this, but um, I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Well, about five years ago, I did a, a contract with World Wildlife uh, Fund in UK to review um, the ecological footprint uh, models uh, models that, that, that were being used in, in the English speaking world. And I, um, I found that there's a huge spectrum of ways that was implemented and some were, um, were more effective than others. But the, the, the one thing that I was concerned about in all of them is it's a black box. You, you put in some data about what your family's doing or what you're doing, and this number pops out. And there's no way that people can see how that number was, was achieved. And so um, if you believe in the black box, if you believe in, in the, the, the ecological footprint model, you, you can do things like um, what uh, McKaylee's family's doing. And, but if, if you're one of those people that wanna know, how did, you, how did I get this number? Um, it, it, it left me uncomfortable. But the, the point is, that, but the other point is, is when you see what McKaylee's family's doing and uh, 
Maureen's talk about what's going, how, how it, it's been used. I think I'm going to go with what Jeff's saying is that we should keep it, but look at all the other options for, for, for people. There's not going to be one simple uh, model that will, will work for everybody. And, um, and I think Bonnie's saying that too, that she, she likes to, to, to see more um, um, transparent methods of, of, of getting the same place. So I'm, I'm stopping talking. Um, I might add a little bit here. Um, the trouble with the trouble with the uh, so I spent time with Bill Reese years ago. Uh, David Suzuki used to say, "If you feel like being depressed, go chat with Bill." And um, <laughs> and, and the, the trouble with a lot of the the models is it's sort of um, 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 it's a bit of a downer. It's sort of what you need to do less of, what you need to do that's a little bit harder, and, and so on. And um, and I think there's sort of limitations. So I've been involved in sort of climate change communications for a couple of decades. And, and I spent a bit of time, sorry to carry on a little bit about this, but so Canada's environment minister, Stephen Gilbo, I happened to know him because we were at Kyoto together uh, 25 years ago. And so I spent some time with him um, a couple of weeks ago chatting. And we were both saying that our, 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 he was with Greenpeace, I was with the Suzuki Foundation, is that we spend a lot of time uh, making people feel guilty. And the opportunity now is actually quite different, is there's real opportunities in actually doing stuff. And, and the, the, the heat pump is an interesting example of that. Like, you know, just deal with um, your energy costs. You also have a more comfortable house and you've got a cooler house in the summer. So there's some, it's sort of the opportunity side that gets people more excited and can get beyond the, the converted crowd who, are, who will do what they can. So those are just some thoughts about this, is it, looking at it in the positive way, what are the opportunities here? Um, you know, e-bikes are another example. It's, it's a real opportunity to sort of change how you move around on Bowen Island. It's a whole lot easier than it used to be. So that's, those are just sort of my general thoughts about that. But certainly we need to continue with the, uh, with the, uh, the calculators. They're very valuable and useful. And, and I love how, Michaela, you described how your family worked on it. So your kids get involved and understand that all our decisions have consequences. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks, David. That that was uh, very very useful. So I think Bonnie, what what I, I get out of this conversation is let's keep the the uh, uh, ecological footprint model and go with as many other things we can find that uh, uh, engage people and and help them uh, move forward. That's great, thank you, thank you very much. So yeah, so I think we've got some good good information to put together a draft um, work plan for next year. Yeah. Thanks. Jeff, a question for me. Give me, a, if you wouldn't mind giving me a reminder about how items find their way onto our work plan. <laughs> I know I've been on the committee for a couple of years now. <laughs> um, and this isn't the first time I've seen it, of course. Um, and what if and you can, if you can speak to the relationship with the island plan as well, too. And I, and I know that many of the items that are on this are also in, in, in the island plan. So they, they go together. But the island plan, what is the timeline for that? And how does that um, give marching orders to our committee? Um, I wonder if you can just kind of give me a bit of a refresher on that. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll answer, and then I think maybe one of the councillors would like to to add to. But um, what I what I have done is, you know, I've um, we've come to the committee um, to get ideas. Also, knowing that sometimes there are council direct, direction to 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 work on something as well. So it's been a combination. Um, of council direction and sort of grassroots, you know, ideas from the committee. Um, also, our guiding document for this committee for this committee is the climate action strategy. So, equating, you know, looking at that, looking at the quick wins, looking at what what can be done um, 
uh, in a in a year. Um, yeah, having it on our work plan. That's those have sort of been the basis. But I like what you're saying, Jeff, and I'm sure one the councillors would love to chime in about this. Is that yes, the island plan um, is the sort of the overarching goals of committee of I mean sorry of the council and. Uh, yeah, sometimes those ideas do percolate through staff to the committee. Um, yeah, and I think there's been examples of where an idea in a committee has then gone to council and then can appear in, a, in an island plan, just plan as well. So I think there's the two-way street there. But yeah, I'd love to hear what the councillors have to say about that. I'll leave this for Maureen since she'll be here, or at least hope she will, and I won't. So Maureen. Okay. Um, uh, it's a really great question, Jeff, and it's a really timely one. Um, I think everyone knows that um, in the past year we um, did a, a review of the, um, the committees, their, their structure, their function, uh, how, they're, how they're operating. And the question of the alignment of the various plans, the island plan, the work plans for individual committees, and also the um, work plans for um, municipal departments. Um, the, the issue of alignment came up repeatedly. Um, how aligned are they? And uh, you know, where, what is sort of the uh, authoritative document? And there was a lot of concern expressed about lack of clarity in timelines for the development of, um, of those three uh, components and also questions about whether council frankly paid as much attention as it should to the work plans for individual committees to make sure that they were reasonable and not just a, a collection of, of, of ideas that were probably good ideas, great ideas, but that perhaps um, may not need to be um, undertaken by uh, a, a municipal committee. So um, I'm, we're, we're meeting with the, Michael Kale and I and some other members of council, we'll be meeting with the chairs and vice chairs of all of the committees um, in about a week's time, this is Friday, to go over the, the findings of that, uh, uh, of that research that we undertook. And I, I think one of the things that will come out of, of that discussion is just that a greater degree of alignment and greater clarity on the um, timelines for the development of the island plan and the related work plans, um, that that clarity is in, in place. So, I mean, Bonnie's, Bonnie's point about it being somewhat fluid in that, you know, if you look at a particular idea, on a work plan, its origin could be island plan, smart idea, carried over from five years ago, so on. It can originate in all sorts of, of places, but there is a, a review by council that is supposed to you know, give thumbs up on proceeding and also um, consider the um, financial impacts, um, both real costs and staff costs of items on that work plan. Does that answer, Jeff, or there, have I missed anything? No, that, that's really good. No, th thank you for that reminder. And, and you know, it's uh, it's coming from different directions and uh, I hear from, from staff and from, from the island plan and ideas that from this committee. Um, I, I wouldn't want to destroy that. You know, there's a lot of good stuff that will make its way onto here that doesn't need to come with formal, maybe direction from council per se, you know, not that uh, that should not be, um, Important element, but um, no, that, that's good. Thank you for that. Thank you. Great. So does that conclude the uh, this uh, section, Bonnie? Great. Well, thank you, everyone. So that the next one is uh, future potential ECAC work plan ideas from Jeff and I, and I'm going to see if Jeff has any to add. Okay, thanks, Will. I mean, maybe um, perhaps we've already talked about kind of the elements that this is really interwoven with the previous item and with, you know, what we just heard about where ideas come from. 
um, you know, part of this came from, I know that, uh, you know, Don had uh, sent around some uh, uh, recent interview with uh, former mayor, Bob Turner, and there's um, lots of great, um, you know, wise thinking in there and, and, and suggestion that perhaps there's, um, you know, there, there's, there's things in there that, that speak to the mandate of our committee and that maybe we need a little bit of discussion that, um, that's, that, that, that thinks about what some future options or directions might be for, for our work plan. So I, I you know, I, we've talked about, um, I guess, in the previous item on, on, on what's already and on, on that work plan and what is going to get carried forward. But, you know, perhaps this is a few minutes to open things up to how we might want to talk about um, what else might um, make its way onto our work plan. Um, Maureen, please. Yeah, I have an idea. Um, in uh, prior years, in pre-COVID, um, we would often have a council meeting where the kids from Bix came and they essentially held a council meeting on a particular topic and they debated the topic. And they did preparatory work at school for, uh, for their debate. They learned about what the job was of, of municipal councillors and committees and so on. And then they had a blast. Um, actually pretending to be the mayor and, and, and so on. And I think it would be a really fun, interesting thing to do to have one of those meetings with um, a climate uh, a climate focus. Um, I'm, I'm certain that you know, in the curriculum, there have to be modules that, that deal with this. And uh, if, if, uh, if the school were up for it, you know, connect. And uh, and see if we could do it. I like that. That that's uh, that, that's a big civics lesson too, which is uh, yeah. um, missing in in a lot of education. Uh, I, I see that uh, McKaylee has her hand up. I would offer also or extend the invitation to Island Pacific School because I believe that's curriculum that Pam Matthews covers in either grade six or grade seven. Um, and um, yeah, be, that would be an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Except my kid wouldn't want me to be there. She would be mortified. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of our job as parents. <laughs> To be mortified. <laughs> to, to mortify our children. Um, so I, th I think that's a, that's a great idea. I think that that should be extended to all committees. Um, but uh, I, I think that would be, uh, that would be uh, very, I think it would be educational for us too, to see what uh, um, kids in those age groups are thinking. Don, do you have any suggestions? Uh, sure, but you know, I, I I think we need a longer discussion. Yeah. To, this is the beginning. Yeah, no, no. I but you know, I, I you know, one of the things that I I, I did I shared the uh, the Bob Turner interview just because I thought it was a really interesting perspective and I liked his thoughts about the biosphere. And uh, while I wanted to go global, he really wanted to stay local and talk about, you know, the only impact we're really going to have on the world is what we do collectively here, which which I'm paraphrasing, but I thought I thought that was very well put. You know, my my struggle is that, and, and my struggle with this committee and my struggle overall is that if. Uh, the United Nations Secretary General has declared a code red. I don't think that we would know that or feel that on Bowen Island. And, and I don't mean that to be critical. It's just that, you know, I, I don't feel that, that we have a, the same sense of urgency that the United Nations has. And, and maybe I'm, you know, doing something differently. And so I, I, I just wonder sometimes if, 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 if our agenda needs to be reworked and we never seem to have a lot enough time to talk about that. You know, we, 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 we just kind of 
rush through so many of these items because there's so many of them rather than rather than maybe have deeper conversations on specific issues and things that we might do so so and I and maybe that's just my issue maybe it's just my problem that I'm I'm more fearful than I need to be about the train coming down the track uh, and and thinking that we can do something more than we're doing uh, so uh, so I'm, and I, you know, I don't have any concrete suggestions other than I, I, I enjoyed Bob Turner's comments. You know, I'm influenced by, by much of what I'm learning in school about, uh, you know, some of the global issues and, and what we might want to consider doing differently than what we're already doing. I, but I can't, we can't have that. We, we can't have that deeper and longer discussion today. So. Yeah. So do you think, Don, that, that uh, we should have a, you know, start setting aside a, um, a, uh, a, a part of our meetings to discuss these issues in more detail? Yeah, I do. I, you know, I, I, I will add to what I was, what I was uh, talking about, because uh, I've, heard, I've heard from two different camps uh, people who want to start their own environmental committees uh, because they don't think there's enough being done on the island, uh, and 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 I, I don't I, I I think the last thing we need is another dozen environmental committees where where we could all join together and we could use use all of those resources and find ways to take advantage of them, but uh, but yeah I think the, the the short answer is. We, we should find a way to, to find some time, uh, whether it's here or whether it's outside this meeting. I mean, it's not that we're going to solve or, or create policy, but we may just come up with some different ideas given the time. Uh, um, Don, I would like to say that given the flooding last November, and I... Um, I am still working towards correcting some of the damage that was done here on Bowen with that flooding. And there's a lot of talk about, oh, it was just a one off. It was a one in 200 flood. Climate change means we're going to see more of this. And the train is going to become very obvious when culverts start failing and that sort of that stuff is happening every five years, even more frequently. My husband is still helping with the Trans-Canada Highway repairs from all the damage that was done last November as well. So I would like to have the discussion and um, share some of that information. You know, there, there, there is a lot of um, evidence that Bowen is starting to have impacts from climate change and um, things that we can do as a committee um, um, to sort of start to look at those processes and what this means. And I, I would love to open up that conversation and, and talk about what that means as a community. Thanks, McKeeley. I think that's uh, that's something we should be doing. So I, maybe Steph and I should talk about this for in the future. Right? Does that make sense, Steph? Okay. Don? I, it, it, it's just just a question because I don't know the answer to it. But 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 are we allowed to? Can our committee have an unofficial meeting or get together? Uh, I mean, I don't know how that that works. Can we can we just have a brainstorming workshop? Sure. I mean, it's just it, maybe that's all we're talking about. And I, Steph has said yes, but but her voice isn't coming through. Hear me? Yes. I hear you now. We, yep. Yeah, we in a restaurant. <laughs> meet in a restaurant with masks. Well, let's meet on a deck. On a deck. Of a restaurant. I. Um, we've, we've had those kinds of meetings with a number of of uh, committees. The environment, uh, the uh, community economic development committee, um, runs on on informal meetings, coming back to the larger group and reporting back. Um, the uh, 
the Heritage Commission basically has to have a workshop every year to get sort of reoriented to to what it's doing. So it's uh, it's definitely an option. Yep. I really like that idea, and I think that's what's needed. Maybe um, we you know we have a full agenda because we've got some business to take care of, and you know we've got. Um, you know, we need to, and we're, you know, we're supporting staff. And, um, and so uh, I, I, I don't see how we can add too much more to our agenda as it is, perhaps for some more frequent meetings, but I think the informal ones perhaps actually maybe, maybe just the right thing that can help, um, um, yeah, uh, bring some of these, um, th th throw some of these ideas around that then could be brought forward more formally. That's good. Okay, let's do it. Um, so, um, can we do a doodle poll um, on on that um, stuff, or or should it be done by us in, instead? What's the what's the procedure? You get if it's informally getting together, then that's all you. I can help you out this time. Okay, well, right. I I will uh, look into doodle polls. And did you want to meet in person then? Um, what do people think? What a crazy idea. Yeah. yeah. As long as we're safe, you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the numbers of, of people in hospital and, and people dying, it's not going away. So uh, as long as we're careful. I think in person outside on a deck or some place like that is a great idea. And it's way better yep. in person than, than in, in a Zoom type of situation. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I will, uh, I will initiate that. Um, I've, I've got uh, two um, suggestions for, <laughs> for future, uh, future work. And interestingly enough, Don, it's based on my relationship with Bob Turner. Um, so uh, uh, the first one is, I'm going to suggest we ask the uh, at Cat Somehow Sound Biosphere Initiative if one of our members can sit in on meet, meetings that they have to keep um, uh, ECAC staff and council informed of initiatives and, and developments in, that, in the bios, biosphere because we're part of it. And uh, uh, I think this is a, a, a wonderful initiative that uh, uh, Bowen should be uh, playing a part in. So that, that's my, my first suggestion. And the other one is uh, Bob and I've had talked about this whole idea of a conservation vision assessment for Bowen that would lead to a, a, a com comprehensive uh, conservation strategy for the island. And I see that this, this is uh, something that the uh, uh, Bowen Conservancy uh, is, is thinking about doing. Jeff has, has been involved in, in, in some discussion about this too. And I, I see this as a, a close fit with the uh, natural assets inventory that uh, the municipality uh, uh, should be doing sometime in the future. So those are two items I suggest we uh, uh, include in the work plan. May I just ask, um, yep. there's a question for Bonnie um, and maybe for David. Do we not already have an established liaison person for council and staff with the Biosphere Initiative? Yes, I believe so, that we it is the manager of environment. Yeah. yeah. So that connection oh. is in place and it's- Yeah, so, so that, that, that would simplify things if, if we just get a report, um, a regular report in meetings about, about that so that uh, we're aware of it. Okay, we're using up time, aren't we? I think we're at two hours. Yes. Can we just blast through this last little bit? Um, the uh, natural asset uh, subcommittee update. 
I'm just going to say that um, uh, we've had our first meeting. We've uh, we divided up the documents from the uh, natural municipal natural assets initiative, uh, and found that there's some really good stuff in there that uh, would be very useful for um, staff uh, when they uh, they they do a, a, a an inventory. Um, we uh, I, I've uh, at the last minute thing, I've sent Bonnie an email asking for just how detailed of a, of a response you need from our subcommittee. Uh, I, I see that the, the work plan says that we just uh, should recommend that uh, uh, staff uh, um, do a, a, a natural assets inventory, but uh, uh, there's so much more. We were, we were actually thinking that uh, we'd uh, our subcommittee would give our committee, the, the overall committee, a, a brief um, uh, presentation about the uh, natural municipal natural assets initiative. Um, and uh, but we we need to talk to Bonnie about uh, how the scope of of, of this uh, initiative that we're doing. Yeah, so we can talk about that and maybe come forward to the committee at a later meeting, maybe. Yeah. I know, you know, we, Carl and I have had discussions with um, the natural asset folks, yeah. um, Michelle Molnar um, at Al, and um, yeah, there's different, different levels, like uh, you could do kind of like a, an, a, an asset um, inventory of like maybe a watershed area. Um, you know, if we do look at a watershed protection plan for Grafton Lake or something in the future like it would fit really nice in that in that um yeah just with staff staff staffing resources that's my only concern yeah. with doing a extensive one not but I think it would be really nice to do promotion some education and also start on something yeah. some sort of natural asset yeah. inventory um but we can talk more about scope and what's actually sure. doable. But get the, the ball rolling anyway, for sure. One, one of the things that excited me about the announcement that there's a lot more money uh, for um, from uh, the province for environmental uh, um, uh, sustainability um, initiatives. I was wondering if, if that money might be available for uh, hiring consultants to, to work with staff on, on this too. So uh, uh, more ideas. So. So I'm going to move on to the next item. Um, michaela has got her hand up there. Oops. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Michaela. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I just, in, in listening to some of Don's um, podcasts and then reading through a lot of the election materials, it seems as though the infrastructure and getting a handle on, you know, the, the infrastructure condition and replacement and that sort of thing um, sort of um, makes this more pressing as part of our infrastructure. How much will this depend on the new council coming in? Well, at the moment, staff has not been directed by council to work on a natural asset inventory. So if we can talk maybe more about it at the committee level, I mean, not a whole bunch more because, you know, action is needed, but um, maybe come up with a, a feasible rec recommendation to council or new council, then, you know, maybe we can figure out a way to, to get it done. If it, if it's, if it's received well by council and, and uh, a resolution is passed. Okay. Any more comments or questions? Okay. I'm moving on to council and committee updates from, uh, there are two councillors. You wanna go first, David? You're muted. Okay, I'll say a couple. So uh, conservation development, um, that policy was passed. And if uh, probably everybody's familiar with that, but basically it aligns with the International Nature Needs Half Initiative and it, that, that we, um, for rezonings, we, we're looking for people to, to cluster their development and leave um, important environmental lands um, in their natural state. And um, um, so it's 
you know, this is this is not something that forces everybody to have 50% of their land, but it's encouraging it. It's it's telling people who are interested in a rezoning that this is the kind of thing that staff is looking for um, in their in, in their proposal. Um, uh, what's next on the list? It's uh, sorry, I'm flipping between screens here. Oh, the site alteration bylaw. Yeah, the concern there is that has been that um, people could just, you know, developers could just get to work and, and do a whole lot of stuff before they applied for a building permit. Or they could actually, um, you know, cut down a lot of trees, scrape a lot of land um, and do all sorts of things um, before they get the building permit. And um, this is an, this, our effort here is to stop that. Uh, to make sure that um, uh, that the land is not being abused and that it's looking at the um, the, the ecological values and, and maintaining them to the greatest extent possible. Um, it's, it's worth having a look at that um, uh, for the details. I won't go into the details now, but it take a bit of time, but you can have a look at that if you, um, I guess if you Google that on the, or search in the municipal website. Um, what, what's next, UBCM? Yep. Yeah. Um, I've got the UBCM thing up on my screen if I move around, or do you want to do that, Maureen? Uh, do you have it on your screen? I, I can speak to, to UBCM. Okay. Um, but just one additional point regarding the site alteration bylaw. There were some concerns expressed by, by Council about the logistics of implementing that uh, bylaw. So there is a, a, it'll come into effect in January of 2023. And then staff will report back within six months about how it's how it's actually working uh, on the on the ground. Um, UBCM, uh, there will be in a day or so a, a summary of uh, the various meetings that we have with um, four ministers and a, a couple more meet, meetings with ministry uh, staff. The the one that's most relevant to this committee is the meeting that we ha had with George Heyman. And uh, you know already that uh, there is a change to the uh, funding that we will be receiving for uh, climate action activities. Uh, shall I keep going? Uh, um, for George Heyman, am I still muted or unmuted? Uh, no, you're there. You're on. So yeah, for George Heyman, the other thing was the motorized use mm -hmm. of, uh, of Mount Gardner. Um, because that used to be the Ministry of Forests that got moved over to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. And um, so they assured us that they are working on that and they think we will have a, a response by the, before the end of the year. The, yeah, maybe I won't say any more about that. I mean, we've been talking to the ministry, the old ministry and now the new ministry about this for several years. And um, they assure us that they're working hard on it and are taking a look at this carefully. Um, we're hopeful that we'll have a, a good result that everybody in this committee will like, would like, but um, you know, we, we're, we're still waiting on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just there are two more points and they're, they're just the detached secondary suites bylaw, which passed and um, to allow, uh, uh, detached secondary suites, um, and then the climate action strategy. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, an update needed before the end of the year. Uh, who's undertaking that? Yeah, I'm supposed to be, and I've, I've been uh, um, not doing my part, uh, but uh, Bonnie and I are promising to work on this, so um, we'll keep promising. Or I'll keep promising, Bonnie. <laughs> And, and I think Carla, Carla would be a great help too. I mean, it's, you know, it's a good strategy. I think it's easy to update sort of what we've done um, where, yeah, I, I, we talked about it, David, how we can sort of make it that living document, but it definitely does need to be updated every couple of years. That committee uh, that did a bunch of work on this. So there's, there's work from that committee that can be folded in. I've got the results of that sitting in my, um, in, in my notes. Great. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the council committee updates. And now staff update. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, really, there's not a lot. I mean, it's kind of all all laid out there. We, you know, taken, we've done a lot of um, action, I think, this year so far. And, 
um, which I feel really good about sort of, um, you know, some initiatives, you know, our, our dive, dive for debris events and the barge cleanup um, where we collected styrofoam and tires. And that was in collaboration with Metro Vancouver. And that was, that was very, that worked out really well. That was, that was great. Um, you know, just taking part in, in events, uh, community events, having an environment, um, presence, I guess, um, and the oyster catcher initiative, the two chicks, the two fledg fledglings this year. So, you know, whether, yeah, it was just so great to see those little fuzzy things just <laughs> standing out on the rock. Um, pictures of, of them, I'll be them blurry pictures, but um, that that was good. And whether or not, you know, I, I like to think that our, you know, the, the work that we did, the stewardship initiatives um, had some effect on the success of those oyster catchers because the, the residents that have been watching them for years have not seen any fledglings for, for quite a few years. So, um, but they were there. And the herons, um, Carla put together a wonderful um, publication, McKaylee, that was a great idea. It's wonderful. And we are mailing those out to the neighbor the neighbors it's really beautiful it, it's really great it will be on our website too but just the neighbors around um adams and eve area i would see Lee parkway um just because there's was a successful quite a few uh maybe three three successful uh three three young from from that heronry this year six all together oh awesome. uh, two nests um, of them were successful so six young pledged that's awesome that's that's the most that I've heard of um in a while here um yeah so that was really great um yeah and IPS Carla's gonna be doing some work with them IP, IPS students um just with some restoration works and plantings they're going to be involved at planting at the fire hall as well um doing some work there and um yeah and I think that's about it Grafton Lake still not ours but again to just have been really considering different options as we move forward um, with respect to what this subcommittee that we talked about here management um of that area as it becomes ours in I don't know when but hopefully soon um yeah so Great. that's it okay thanks Bonnie so um that's uh, that's it. Next meeting to be announced. Adjournment is now, and it's a little past two fifty-five, but not that bad. I thought it was. We're still pretty good. Well done, everyone. So, um, looking forward to seeing everybody uh, soon. And and uh, we'll we've lost Jeff and and Don to uh, time constraints, but uh, I will uh, see about getting our meeting informal meetings uh, started i'm looking forward to it all right okay. take care bye everybody yeah okay.